Hello, Black Like Me podcast family. You know, if I want to find anything about current news or events, it's fairly easy. I either grab my smartphone or I turn to one of the many 24 hour news outlets that we have on cable. But where do you go for wisdom? Good old mother wit, common sense. In my community, when you want it to really get wisdom, not just knowledge and information, but how you live out that knowledge, you'd sit around older people, older African-American people. That was the beauty and the strength of the beauty parlor, the barbershop, the church, family functions. You'd listen to the gray haired people who would tell you what it was like in their day. Well, with all that's going on in our world today, I need some wisdom. And so I called on three individuals Um, all of whom I looked up to growing up in this community. They were all state workers, which was important to me because remember, this season of Black Like Me is really focusing on the, the trouble in Wisconsin and how there's a state of emergency regarding how black people are treated compared to their white counterparts. Well, then COVID and all of the other things that have happened sort of hijacked the focus However, we still know that Wisconsin's a hotbed when it comes to race relations. And so I reached out to three elders, folks who worked for the state, helped to shape the reality of Wisconsin, not just for black people, but for all people. And they have something else in common. At one point in time, each of them served as the president of our local NAACP an organization that was created nationally in 1909 in response to the violence against black people. And so I want to share some of the wisdom of Kirby Mack, Greg Jones, and Francis Huntley Cooper, people who have not only shaped Madison, Dane County, but Wisconsin. And I wanted to know what older black people who had raised children, who had grandchildren, what they thought about what has caused such a rift in Wisconsin, what has made Wisconsin worst among other states, and just their take on what was happening in our world today. I'm proud to share some of this wisdom from these gray-haired, tried-and-true individuals. They have helped to guide me at some point in my career and life, and I'm sure that something they share today is going to help you do the same. Enjoy this. Hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask if they touch your hair? (laughs) Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G, a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Black Like Me. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. And I keep telling you all week after week after week, it is my job to bring you these powerful conversations um, with African-American trendsetters, pace setters, um, folks who I consider um, to, 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 to be the elite, who just talk about their journeys, their lives, their expectations, and how they reached excellence because they were trained to do so. And parenthetically mentioning some of the navigation skills they've developed to do that inside a white structure, right world. Today's discussion is with um, three key leaders in our community um, who just happen to be black. They're not black leaders. They are leaders who happen to be black. And they're going to be talking with me about the state of Wisconsin and the state of emergency. We're known as one of the worst places in the country for black people to live. And I want to talk to people who have spent their entire careers making Wisconsin a better place and what they perceived to, to, to be the problem. So my three guests are Kirby Mack, Francis Huntley Cooper, and Greg Jones. Kirby Mack has, ser- has served in both state and local government for over 36 years. Um, she was appointed by Governor Jim Doyle to serve two terms as the administrator of the Division of Enterprise Services. Um, Ms. Mack also has a master's degree in public policy and public administration from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I believe that that's from the, the La Follette. Um, Public Policy Institute. Um, she just has a plethora of things that that she uh, has done and that that she's skilled in. I have to also say that she is one of the board members of the Nehemiah Community Development Corporation, the organization I founded almost 30 years ago. Um, a personal friend and a part of our 
of our congregation as, as well. She also served as the city's affirmative action um, director. Frances Huntley Cooper made history back in April 2nd, 1991, when she became Wisconsin's first and only African-American mayor. Uh, she served as the mayor of Fitchburg, Wisconsin, the city from which I hail, and Mr. Jones does also from 91 to 93. She studied social services from um, North Carolina a and She's got a master's of social work from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also master's in public policy and administration um, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She served, I believe, three terms as a board of trustee member of Madison College. I believe she also chaired it. She has about 28 years or had about 28 years in social services and social work supervision for Dane County Department of Human Services, also appointed by Governor James Doyle to work in the Department of Workforce Development under Secretary Roberta Gassman. Mr. Greg Jones has, high, has held so many positions, both in education and higher ed, a recruiter, missions officer for the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. I held a comparable position at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so I know how, much, how hard that work is. In state government, he's worked in the governor's office, the Departments of Public Instruction, Health and Social Services, Corrections, Employment Relations, Workforce Development, and Commerce. He's currently, he currently serves as the president of Dane County NAACP. I, I don't usually read people's resumes, but I need you to know that while I was growing up in this community, and by no means does that mean these folks are, are old, but as I was growing up, these were the influencers, the movers and shakers who influenced me. And so uh, I'm just gonna bring them all on right now. Uh, Ms. Kirby, Madam Mayor, Mr. Jones, how are you all doing today? Wonderful, wonderful, glad to be here. Doing great, yes, very good, thank you very much. Good morning. Having a wonderful day being on this podcast with all of you. I know, you know, and, and Ms. Francis, listen, I, you, you, I think your term as, as Fishburg mayor ended in 93, and I still call you mayor when I see mm -hmm. you. Um, one, because that's historic. I think when you do something like that, you don't, right. um, you don't forget that. So listen, you all, I'm so glad that you all are on here because one of the things I didn't read is that at some point, each of you has served as, as a president of, of a local NAACP chapter. So you all bring a bunch of experience together in into this discussion. So I'm really glad that you're here. Listen, bef before we go into our discussions, we like to break the ice with something that I call black icebreakers. <laughs> so I got these questions. Don't worry, nobody's gonna lose their black card. Listen, <laughs> all, you all have done. And so um, I'll just throw, anybody can answer the first one. And then um, I, I might have somebody helping me serve as co-host to pick who answers the others. What does it mean you all in our community when somebody dreams about fish? They're pregnant. Somebody's pregnant. In the house. <laughs> somebody's pregnant. Not yep. necessarily the person that had the dream, but when somebody's like, I dream about fish. Someone, <laughs> someone in the family is pregnant. From someone in the family. family. That's right. That's right. Somebody's yep. about to go down south to spend time with TT. Uh, <laughs> true. True. Oh. You all, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, um, <laughs> listen. Uh -huh. And Miss Kirby, I, you grew up in Chicago, so but this is to everyone. But I'm going to start with you, Miss Kirby, because I don't know if this is just a Chicago thing, because that's my family's from. Right, but in okay. the 60s and 70s, I, I remember right. black folks having a shrine in their living room on their mantelpiece, and it was photos, three photos. Do you can you name any of the Ooh. folks that were in photos in in mm -hmm. in? Uh, Luther King, yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. and who was Ma the other? Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King, and uh, Kennedy. <laughs> it was it was it was Kennedy. It was Malcolm. It was it was um, M. R. And some of them had Jesus. So I like the ones I remember: J. F. K. Uh, 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 J. C. Uh, 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 now, now how, now how about where you grew up? Now, Mr. Jones, you grew up in Mississippi. Grew up in Mississippi. Those same those same four portraits were on every wall. I remember <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus goodness. being the fourth one. <laughs> Come on, you are right. Come on, Madam Mayor. How about how about where you grew up? Did y'all have those shrines? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Man, you, all know, of those. you all, when our white listeners hear this show, they're floored that we've grown up in different worlds mm. different pla and that we have these things. And so anyway, I'll talk about more of that at the end. Okay. Do any of you, um, you know what, Miss Kirby, since I've known you the longest, who should I point this next question to? I'm gonna let you be my, I'm gonna let you be my band of black. How about, um, you all, how about our mayor? All right, mayor, do, all right. do you remember, did you have relatives or did you ma'am at any point mm -hmm. during a long trip down south, up north, mm -hmm. have a shoebox with foil in it. <laughs> <laughs> is that the carry the, is that the carry the chick is that the transport the chicken in like <laughs> the bus or the train? You know, from the south to the north, and you would pick, pack your lunch. Yes, right. 
<laughs> those are, I like those are our thermos boxes. Yes. <laughs> With the, with the fr- always with the fried chicken. With the fried chicken <laughs> and the foil in it. Yes. My white colleagues are blown away. And young generation don't know this. I have to realize yes. that some of these questions, I'm having fun with you all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the because, question because is, why? Why huh? did we need, that's it, the question remain, I mean, is why did we need? Those? Come on, Miss Kirby, tell them why, break it down. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Because we knew that if that bus or train stopped, exactly. they were not going to serve us. So right. we had to bring our own food. Right. Is that what you're saying, Miss Kirby? Yes. And when you stopped at the at the right. restroom, you right. uh, made certain that all eyes on your children, on your family, mm-hmm. and you were in and out. Right. Yeah. No, I got you. Oh, so we going uh, way back, aren't we? We going yes. way back. <laughs> all right, Miss Kirby, who do I pick for this next question? No, I asked you the question, Miss Kirby, and then you tell me who will answer it. Okay. Okay. All right. What did old folks use to get a fish bone out your throat? When you swallow oh, fish, you know what? that would have to be Greg. Greg would know that question. The answer. Greg, this, this is how, and it happened to me so many times because I was <laughs> greedy. I would eat fast. Uh, what Mama would do is say, "Give me some white bread." Yes. And you would chew that white bread and swallow and take that bone on down to, <laughs> to your digestive system. Come on, and that's what I remember. Do you know anything about wheat bread or grain bread? We always ate white bread. Oh, yeah, always ate white bread. White bread. bread. Uh, oh my That's god. What it was. Oh no, cracking me up. <laughs> Listen, did y'all have okay, Miss Okay, this open to anyone. Did you grow up around a mom, a grandmother, aunt who would make you do or stop doing certain things during a lightning storm? Do you remember what some of those things were? Like if it was storming outside. Yes. What was it? Get away from the window. Turn behind down and be still. <laughs> be still. Get away from the window. Miss Kirby's right. Get away from the window, but be still. Right. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Sure oh, was. My goodness. Miss Francis, were you taught not to split the pole as you walked down the street with friends? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. And what is splitting the pole, ma'am? Um, two people walking and, and together and you one go on one side and one go on the other. Don't do right. that. Don't, don't do, do that. If you gotta go there, don't forget about the cracks in the street. Don't step on them. Don't step, step on, on the crack. the cracks. <laughs> Break right. them on back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh-huh. My goodness. Now, this, now, this might be just my generation. Mm-hmm. But why did black people watch Hee Haw on Saturday nights? Weren't that many choices. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I, I was showing my daughter some old uh-huh. clips when they were singing Gloom, Agony, mm-hmm. Gloom, Despair, Agony on me. She was looking at me like, Daddy, have you lost your mind? How do you know? Mm-hmm. How do you know these songs? How do you know who Junior is? To me, it uh, just still cracks me up that black folks used to watch. Yeah. Yeehaw. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. All right, and wrestling. And ma'am? Wrestling. And wrestling. Yeah, we watched that wrestling, too. But at least you all had TVs where I grew up. There mm. was, I didn't have a TV until I went to college. There was no television in my house. Mm. Oh, really? Okay. Right. And so I would go to a neighbor's house on a Sunday night and watch Bonanza. That was my, that was the one I liked. We, black people love Westerns. Right. Yeah, Bonanza, yeah. Mm-hmm. Gunsmoke, mm-hmm. Rifleman. Right. Those were the ones. But the one that I remember a whole lot was, was the Grand Old Opry. I don't know if you all saw that one. Yes. But down south, that was a huge, huge uh, television show for the black community. I mean, even families who didn't have TVs would flock to another family's mm-hmm. house mm-hmm. just to watch that show. And I could never figure out why. It was so country, so lame, but they loved it. That generation loved it. That was and those folks, love. those folks have to know they have black, they have black viewers. It's very interesting yeah. because oh, yeah. we probably, the perception is we don't interact a lot with that crowd. But I think it was about Southern right. culture. Right. You know, back in the day, black culture right. and social, you know, Southern culture were very similar. And you know, Alex, to this day, I still watch those programs starting at twelve o'clock. And don't forget wagon train. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, Miss Kirby, I haven't heard somebody say wagon train in 40 years. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. No, no, y'all. Another popular one. You know, you all, what, I, what I love about this is um, during this U.S. Black History course that we offer through, through our Nehemiah work, mm. Professor Christy Clark Pujara um, lectures, and Miss Kirby had a chance to sit in on some of her lectures, but she states Black people cannot, can never be seen as a defeated group of folks because defeated people don't create culture. So the okay. fact that we're talking about experiences from Mississippi, Chicago, mm-hmm. Wisconsin, mm-hmm. North Carolina, mm-hmm. and we all know what, what, what a white bread will fix. Um, we all know, they have these different experiences. We didn't have texting or instant messaging, but yet this was in us. Right. And we share it. Right. We share it. And when, when our listeners, 
they, they scratch their heads because they don't understand how we have this sense of connection. That's also why we speak and nod to each other. We see each other. It's also why when someone is hurt like uh, or, or murdered, like Ahmaud Arbery or Mr. Floyd yeah. in Minneapolis, or this gentleman in, in New York, you know, who had the police call to him by this white woman for asking her to put a dog on a leash. We feel it very, very deeply because there's a sense of connection. We have not bought into mm-hmm. this rugged individualism. And so when I ask these questions, it loosens us up and makes us laugh, but it also reiterates how strongly knit we are culturally without even knowing we all knew those mm-hmm. same things. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right, right. Now, let me just introduce one other piece of the cultural conditioning that we've all shared uh, and learned, and that's the communication system. Think of how party lines used to exist by the, uh, the, by yeah. the telephone company. Mm-hmm. Now, that was in California. I remember the first time I picked up the receiver and I heard other people talking. I thought it was ghosts until mama said, no, that's, you got to wait until they get done or you got to figure out how to get around. Mm-hmm. But the party line telephone calls has evolved. Think about the system now to text messaging, using the phone to send individual messages to other individuals. How's that impacted us in terms of who we are and what our generation has, uh, has experienced? And I can tell you now, my children don't know nothing about a party line telephone. <laughs> right. You're right. How, and what mm-hmm. it meant, you know. But it was it was very common and right. a mirror piece that you would expect. Uh, Instagram is their party line. That's how they get on the camera. <laughs> exactly. Right. Instagram. We live in change. It sure does. You know, you all when I listen, when I think about you, um, I think about the collective ingenuity, brilliance, experience, and and, and diligence in being public servants. You all weren't just workers here in, in Wisconsin, but you were your public um, servants. You know, two thirds of you elected to positions by, by governor. And so I'm not gonna rehearse all the issues about Wisconsin because we're all aware of it because we mm-hmm. live here. Um, many of our listeners, most of our listeners are not from Wisconsin, but they're learning from what's happening here in terms of disparity and its impact on black folks because it's, it's offering a lens to which to understand race relations in a broader, um, broader um, um, in, in the country. So let me just ask each of you, just real briefly, what brought you to Wisconsin? Was it work or school or, or family? So Ms. Kirby, I'll start with you. What, what brought you to Wisconsin? Actually, my husband, well, at the time we were, um, we were not married, but uh, my boyfriend at the time uh-huh. <laughs> uh, received a four-year scholarship from UW to play football. And um, uh, Subsequently, the next, I guess, couple of years later, I came here to, to work. And I, um, you know, I'm from what, it was so interesting coming here to hear people talk about the inner cities. Of, uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm thinking, thinking, what is inner city? Because I'm from the ghetto. So what, right. what, <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is that the same thing? So it was just so, uh, interesting uh, and water coolers versus the water fountains. You know, they'll call, they'll call them bubblers too. Bubblers, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. bubblers. Never so, heard it. Yeah. yeah, so it was so interesting uh, it, it, to get away from really, uh, Chicago was pretty rough during that time and it's continued to, to be so, which is why I was kind of surprised that we hired a superintendent from Chicago because I knew I would never want to raise my children and my family in Chicago under the you know educational system there. Uh, so I, um, I came uh, with, with my husband. We um, raised three children here. I went on to get my, to obtain my master's degree in, in uh, public uh, policy analysis and public administration and worked for a variety of different um, organizations, entities, government really for 36 years and the state official, been a, a city official for many years. And uh, it was a nice place, nice place. It was a place where you knew you had to stay involved. I stayed engaged uh, as my children went through school. Many times they thought that I was a, a teacher at, at the school because I was there That's so the often. Because I knew it was important to, uh, to help uh, the, the, uh, the administration understand that, that all children aren't, aren't alike and aren't to be treated the same, that they're different. And that it, it was important that there be a, uh, a perspective uh, from black folks, even though we, we had NAACP and Urban League, but um, in the earlier years, I, I don't know how vocal they were, but as I grew up and became more involved, and I think uh, both uh, Greg and, no, Greg was after me, but but surely like Dr. Odom and uh, 
and Francis led the way in, in many respects, and Malele, Chikasa Nana, yes, who yeah. passed, Certainly. led the way. And so I could see that there were some, um, some people that I could, could work with and gravitate to, 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 um, to, to make a better community for my, uh, my children and my family. And you certainly have helped to do that, ma'am. How about you, Mayor? What brought you to Madison? Work or school? Uh, school. <clears throat> I didn't even know where. I didn't know where the heck Wisconsin was. I know we're on <laughs> podcast. I won't use any inappropriate no, no, language here. No, no, no. That's the good thing about the podcast. You can say hell on here because it's like. Oh well, that's what I used to say. Where in hell is Wisconsin? <laughs> um, I'm still asking that question. <laughs> and. Um, so what brought me here was school, and um, I initially was planning to go to Case Western. And during the summer before I was to enroll or start in August, I was working in New York City because that's where uh, I was born in New York City, and I grew up in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so I had gotten a call, you know, UW was trying to recruit people of color to come here and get their degrees. It was under the Ruth Doyle um, yes. administration. Yes. Um, so that's what brought me me here because they, you know, take care of the money, pay your tuition. You know, I'm like, okay, I can go here. I can deal with that. And um, so I came here and wanted to get the heck out of here really quick. So I came in August. I had my, my master's in social work by December of 74. Right. I mean, a year and a half, I'm like, I'm out of here. And then <laughs> I decided, okay, I get a job, you know, get some experience before you go right. somewhere. And that's what happened. Met Mr. Cooper, sort of like Kirby's story. Um, well, she came with the man. I came, the man, you know, Al was from Mississippi. So um, he was here and we connected. And next thing we know, married, children. And for me, staying here, um, that was a decision because I didn't plan to stay here at all. Mm -hmm. um, I did not accept that I was here in Wisconsin, even though I had job, husband, children, until I became mayor. I used to always tell people I was from everywhere but here. <laughs> And when I got elected mayor of Fitchburg, <laughs> I had to then say, okay, you can't be mayor of a city and not be from here. That's right. <laughs> you know, so that's when I then said, okay, you know, I'm from, I'm from Fitchburg um, and, and raised uh, two beautiful children here. Um, our children were in the Verona School District. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that was really difficult for them, you know, going through a, for them, predominantly white high school and, right. and K through 12. Um, and they wanted to get over in the Madison School District, Miss Kirby. <laughs> they wanted to get over there with the with the West High School and the mm -hmm. kids, more kids that look like us. Right. Um, right. But that didn't happen. Um, uh, Kirby and our Kirby knows that our daughters hung out together a little bit, and Jack mm -hmm. and Jill and all those groups. Right. Um, but that's what brought me here. And then I think the reason why I'm still here, even though um, my son is still here, my daughter is in North Carolina with her children. But what's kept me here because I'm back and forth is the health care. As I'm a senior citizen, uh, Wisconsin, I don't care what we say, but Wisconsin has excellent health care services it for does. us. I've experienced it even recently, you know, going to North Carolina, having a problem with a, a tooth uh, falling out or something happening in my mouth. And I was on my way to North Carolina and I called back here and was able to get more help than I was when I was in North Carolina. Mm. So the healthcare system still is top priority. And there are people who move away, but come back here for healthcare. I've heard they of it. Tired. Yeah, there, there, there are folks you know who move away and they, will, they have their regular appointments with their doctors. So at, as a senior citizen, um, I'm feeling that that's most important to me, um, to mm -hmm. be in a place that I, I know doctors, they know me. Hopefully I'll get decent treatment. If I go south, that's a, that could be a whole, di that not could be, that would be a whole different story. Mm. So that's, that's what sort of brought me here and has kept me here, surprisingly. No, 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 that's, that's a great, you all are giving very insightful answers. And how about you, Mr. Jones? What brought you here? Well, if you, some of you, well, Kirby may know, but um, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was an organization out of Chicago called the Ada S. McKinley Education Services. Mm -hmm. There were two black men who canvassed Southern black high schools in the states of Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and so forth. Their job was to introduce high school juniors and seniors from the predominantly black schools about state colleges in Iowa, Wisconsin, <laughs> Illinois, Michigan, all like that. 
those two jokers introduced eight kids. We were the top eight students at Oak Park School, which was a black school. Uh, so at the end of our high school careers, four of those kids applied to UW Eau Claire, which was one of the schools introduced to us by those two, two black men. My sister and two other young ladies went to Bishop College in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. We were out at Bishop College for about two weeks until the financial aid director called all four of us in and said, y'all parents need to send us a down payment for your tuition. We had all applied for financial aid. None of us had scholarships. I had made the baseball team playing second base for, <laughs> for Bishop College. And we called mamas after that meeting and said, can y'all, they said, y'all know we ain't got no money. So all four of us got on the bus, went back to Laura, Mississippi, and enrolled in Jones County Junior College for the next two years. Mm. Then we followed our four friends from high school to UW Eau Claire. So it was friends who recruited us, and it was a matter of all of us leaving the state of Wisconsin for the first time. So that's what brought me here, which was the four friends and going to UW Eau Claire. Once we got to Eau Claire, that's when I met folk from Chicago, Milwaukee, Kenosha, and all over the state, black kids, and Minneapolis. There was never a whole lot of black kids there. Uh, there was about 100 of us in the fall of 73 is when I first arrived along my group and I finished up my last two years there. Uh, and once I finished those, I got a job uh, as in it was called the Black Student uh, Office. I was an advisor to black students. And a lot of that advising was personal, social, and some academic kind of uh, advising. From right. that job, I moved into the admissions office uh, and began to recruit statewide. And from the recruiting job, uh, that's what got me in touch with Madison and Governor Dreyfus's office. I was appointed by Governor Dreyfus in his office uh, back in 80, I think it was 82. Mm. And that's what brought us to Madison. From that short experience, because if you remember, <laughs> I came down in April and then probably August, he announced that he wasn't going to run for re-election. So following that experience is when I began my state um, state government experience in the various uh, departments and so forth. So that's how I got to Wisconsin. And uh, I met Gwen at UW Eau Claire. That led to the romance, swept it off her feet. We got married and then of course the kids and family uh, followed. So that's kind of a short version of how I got here. Uh, and I think it, it's been the work, the committed work uh, that's kept me here. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I learned aspects of your stories that I didn't realize. I also didn't realize that each of you had been appointed by a Wisconsin governor right. to, to key roles. And so, Ms. Kirby, let me, let me ask you, you came from Chicago's west side, 16th Street. So yeah. anyone who knows Chicago, that, there's a little renaissance going on there. But anyone who's like my age and older understand you don't, you don't play on 16th Street. And so Ms. Ms. <laughs> Kirby is, is a picture of loveliness. <laughs> okay. you know, she's got her delta colors and pearls and stuff on but if you're from 16th street miss kirby that means you know how to box so i just want to say oh, that you right. know how to you you just know you, yeah, she's taking her earrings off and she's gonna reach for the bottle of vaseline next so she get ready to throw down <laughs> there you go. so that had to be night and day miss kirby you're going from the west side of chicago okay. to madison what was your what was your cultural connection what kept you sane, or did you go back and forth to chicago on weekends i went back and forth to chicago on the weekends i tell you i used to cry at night Wow. I used to cry myself to sleep because uh, there was absolutely no interaction with, uh, with Black folks here. And what, what I found is that the university setting was a very different community uh, than, than the African-American community or the locals. Very yeah. different, night and day. So you, you okay. could inter interact and have an exchange with people on campus and in the higher ranks of, of government. But you'd come to the community and one, one part of the, the city didn't know the other at all. So it was, it was very difficult. Uh, and then after having children and getting involved, and um, my my uh, my parents, my father always had a, a, a basketball team, mm -hmm. uh, girls basketball team, boys basketball team. And being that my husband played football and I was a cheerleader in high school, I thought, you know, God always says, "Look in your hands." <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have the answer in your hands. So Jeff and I got involved in uh, Southside Raiders, and he was coaching. I was uh, the Booster Club president. We raised money. I remember one organization, Southside uh, Madison, told us where, they, we, where we received our funding from from the program for the for the football and cheerleading program. 
is they, um, they would give us, I forget what the amount was, just a minuscule amount every year. And I thought, uh, we could apply for other grants and programs and get more money. And, you know, I approached them with that, and they said, well, go and do it. And I said, well, I guess we will then. So, so I applied for grants, and we had more money than we had ever had uh, in, the, in the, the history of that program and did fantastic things. So what we, what Jeff and I did is, is stayed involved in the community. We, huh? we take our kids from the east side to the south side. People were really apprehensive about uh, having their children on the south side. And when Jeff and I came over there, you we saw more people, uh, Hispanics, whites, from all over the city, because we were winning, of course. Right. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> and they knew the, the coach was from UW, so they knew, you know, Jeff from, from Michigan. Right. So we just stayed involved. And that's what we've done uh, our entire mm -hmm. lives here in Madison. Wow. wow. That's, that's, I appreciate that. Right. Hey, Ma hey, Mayor, I want to ask you a question. You know, after President Barack Obama was elected, America felt that we were post, um, a post-racial society, post, even, even post-racism, that that had somehow fixed things. But before he was elected, you were mayor of Fitchburg, Wisconsin. I live in it now. I went to school in Leopold in Fitchburg right. back in the early 70s uh, when it was all cornfields yes. out here. Like out here in Fitchburg, they, like there's McGaw Park. Yes. I went to school with the McGaws. Yes. Um, so... It would, be, it would be easy for people in Wisconsin, our state motto is forward, to think that Wisconsin is this bedrock of, of, of liberal, progressive mind, mindset. Because we, we elected an African-American mm -hmm. woman in Fitchburg, yeah. mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Right. Uh, just open our eyes a little <laughs> bit. And electing an African-American to a mayoral position is certainly historic and it's fantastic. But it doesn't mean that it's an right. anti racism. Am I correct right. in saying that, man? Right. Um, you know, it was it's, it wasn't easy um, to run and get elected, and and really that was not an area I was interested in. I was on the city council, had mm -hmm. served on the city council for two terms, and and um, my goal was to get off the city council and just go back and do what I wanted to do. And um, the mayor at the time. Um, had decided not to run, and he had approached me, and I said, "Nope, not interested." He goes on on tell on a radio show, and I go to work one day, and someone says, "Um, I hear you're running for mayor." And where did you get that from? <laughs> well, <laughs> the mayor at that time was Tom Cap, and he had went on and said it anyway, even though I had said, "No, I'm not interested." Um, yeah. and then I just said, "Well, you know, he'll get enough phone calls, and he'll leave me alone." <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> and uh, so he was instrumental in uh, working my campaign and supporting and promoting me. Um, and that's how, you know, that's how I, you know, got into this. But I, I was, when I ran, um, there were people, there were a lot of naysayers and there were people who, the Wisconsin Historical Society, we were checking on uh, the status of if, you know, what my, if I ran, uh, would I be the first? And yeah. I and I didn't do what I normally would do, which is when I'm talking to folks, I usually take notes and write the name. And I was checking that out with the library, with the historical society. And this woman came on and said, "Oh no, um, you would be the first, but um, that's not going to happen. The only place it would happen is a place like Milwaukee, or Racine, that has a larger black population. So mm. you're getting told by people." at um, a historical institution, Wisconsin Historical Society at the time. No, that can't happen to you. And yeah. um, then there were other folks who just, you know, put up all kinds of roadblocks. But what you have to realize is that um, you have to know that that's something you want to do, not that somebody else wants you to do that. And having that and having the support and not giving up, you know, helped me move forward. But in the primary, and this is where it's real important, in the primary, there were like three men running against me because the guys felt that they could bump me out. It was all strategic. <laughs> Some of them had been in politics in Fitchburg for a while. So their goal was to, you know, I'm sure they had their little men's caucus. Sure. They'll run against, <laughs> we'll bump her out, and then one of us will prevail. Mm -hmm. So my goal was to make it through the primary. And I came in second, and I was really disappointed. And then I was told, you know, the bottom line, we needed to get you through the primary. We needed to get you there. And once I had um, got through the primary, we reorganized the campaign, restructured it. And my opponent was on the city council with me. And I knew that he could out, out knock on more doors. He was a white male. I'm not going out knocking on doors at night. 
There's a lot of issues in Fitchburg or anywhere. (laughs) In Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, you know, she's, who is she? We don't know who she is. She disappears. She's gone. I'm like, that was part of that Southern history that you just think of and not feeling safe. And Sheila Stubbs proved that that is the case. Yeah. 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 Sheila Stubbs. Right, right. So, um, so I didn't knock, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to knock on more doors, but I went into various communities and advantage of being African-American is they see you. I can, I may not knock on every door, but they, okay, we're over in Alex G's neighborhood. We're in Greg Jones neighborhood, you know, the different, mm-hmm. and, and I could just be walking down the street. I'm not going to necessarily have knocked on every door, but they know you're in the community. Right. So it was a lot of that, that, um, mm-hmm. But there was a lot of work because remember, for me running for mayor, I was still a full time um, employee with the Dane County Human Services. I was a social worker supervisor. So I had a full time job. It's not like the mayor of um, Madison that gets paid full time job and that's the job. My mayor's job was on the side. So I had to work. And then I had I was a mother, um, you know, so I had the children to worry about getting them to school and um it, it, it business as usual so it's i had all of that to do and the one thing you want to do is try to do a good job because people are looking at you and they were and you want to make sure that you leave the doors open for others to come behind you i didn't want to be the person who had all kinds of dramas and issues and they said we well, remember that was a black woman and she ran and she did all this so we don't need another black one you know so i tried to stay out of that and just sure. do the right thing. And that's, um, it's not easy. But the one other thing I wanted to add to that was everybody reflects and when they think of Francis something Cooper, they think of mayor. And I was elected, not appointed, because some people think I was appointed or, or whatever. But um, the thing that I struggled with, um, Reverend G, was that um, there was a lawsuit that I was involved in at the county level. And most people don't know that. They just see me as, you know, she had this good position, you know, mayor. Right. Right. They don't understand the struggles that I had here in Dane County, working for an agency that's supposed to give back and take care and, of people. And I was fighting with a lot of the um, internal structure so that our kids and our families could get the same treatment that others were getting. You know, and that that is not something that people understand. And, you know, I applied for many positions um, would rank, you know, the first, second, or third. Other people would get hired over me over and over again. And that got me into a lawsuit to help others um, build their lawsuit um, against the county because there was a lot of inequities, injustices going on at the county level that affected Black folks. We weren't getting promoted. And um, then that uh, opened up doors for others. But the county was not as receptive as people thought it is. Um, Uh And those are the struggles that a lot of us back in the day went through over and over. So it was just it was just an honor when I was able to become uh, mayor of a city and work with people from all backgrounds and serve a great city. Um, So I was proud of that accomplishment. That is that's tremendous. Hey everybody, this is Tyler, the podcast manager of Black Like Me. Just wanted to jump on and share two quick things about Black Like Me. Number one, Patreon. Patreon is an opportunity for you if you like our show at all, if you enjoy it, if you want us to keep creating this content to be able to support us financially and to help us do that. If you're as little as $2 a month, you can join our team. We also have some other higher tiers with some more benefits if you join. So please go to patreon.com slash blacklikeme to hear more. Number two is that if you are interested in having Dr. G speak, if you're interested in him doing some consulting for you, your organization, anything like that, you can go to alexg.com slash contact and you can fill out a form to be able to see how you might be able to bring Dr. G to your business or your community. All right, back to the show. Um, were you, each of you around when WAPSI started the Wisconsin Association of State Black Employees? <laughs> Look at Kirby and, and Greg. Yeah. Okay, I started working at, at UW-Madison in the admissions office in 88. Uh, a few months before I got married. Mm-hmm. And so I remember being invited right away. They came in and said, you get to go to Wapsie. I said, what Wapsie? <laughs> what was Wapsie? And they said, well, first of all, when they told me it was at Lake Geneva, I said, I'm going to Wapsie. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you know. But I walked into that place and saw more Black people than I had seen mm-hmm. gathered in Wisconsin in, in my, whole, my whole lifetime. But mm-hmm. Black people shaped that. They wanted to bring public employees together to do stuff. 
Um, I, I don't know that we organize and create things like that. I, I won't even get into like why it was dismantled, why it's not functional. Right. Now I think it probably had to do with funding from white organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, no. Leadership. no. It wasn't, it wasn't even about funding, Ms. Kirby. No, but, but people organized around that. And I don't see like state associations like that. So I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. what did you all have in your generation that made you say, I'm, you know, I'm from North Carolina, I'm from Mississippi, I'm from Chicago. I see maybe two and a half, three black people a day, a week, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna create in, I'm gonna create structures and I'm gonna move up through the ranks because I'm not limited. Mm -hmm by not seeing other role models. You all probably didn't think it, but you were becoming the role models that others would see. What was in the drinking water as y'all grew up? What were y'all being told in church? What made y'all do more than just whine on the sidelines and just become trailblazers? Uh -huh. Right, well, when we started WAPSI, uh, it was, we, you know, as, as government officials and, and professionals, we were going to conferences and, and and realize that we could do this. You know, there's a need. If, if we want African Americans primarily to move up in state government, they needed to know basic, uh, uh, th there were basic studies right. that they needed to know about. They needed to know personnel. They needed to know right. uh, uh, budgeting. They needed to know finance. They needed to know, and it wasn't so much IT, but right now it's IT. They're, they're ver they're, we knew that in order for us to move up through the, through the ranks, that we needed to teach our people how to, um, to uh, what, these, what these different areas in government were about. And, you know, you have a, a personnel department in every department. I mean, in every state agency, you had finance, you had budgeting, you had, you know, various disciplines. So we knew in order to do that, we had to bring the groups together. So those of us that were in uh, high level positions uh, came together, we met, uh, we knew exactly. we someone uh, who was close to the governor. So we had uh, Howard Fuller at the time. He worked uh, with us and uh, we knew we had to, to get, the in, get the support from department secretaries. And once uh -huh. we obtained that, we, uh, I was responsible for making sure we had a, a point person at every state agency. So every state agency, I connected with some African-American, the highest level I could in that department, and we worked together to, uh, to bring that, that conference together. And I think when you ask where wow. it derives from, I think we all have that fight in us. I mean, being all <laughs> in NAACP mm -hmm. past presidents, you know, like, sure. we, yeah. up, mm -hmm. you know, we grew up in, and, and again, I'm on the west side of Chicago. We knew uh, for, you know, the Daily Machine. I don't know if you remember that, uh, Pastor sure. G. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was a force in Chicago, and our fathers and 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 parents and uncles were all precinct captains, and we knew that there was that struggle at the pole. So yeah. that was the kind of, we knew that we needed community programs, and those were the kind of things that we brought with us. I'm sure each of us with us when we came to Madison. There's a fight to not accept things as they are status quo. Wow, that that's you all are bringing some some history into this. So. In your respective worlds, departments, divisions, when did you look around and, and say, uh-oh, something's going wrong in Wisconsin? Because people think that, we, that some of these issues are just new, mm -hmm. disparity between our kids and reading and economics. But y'all have been here since, mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. uh, you know, 70s and the 80s. And so I'd like for each of you just to take a moment and just say, like, when did you look around and say, Wisconsin is walking backwards or... Wisconsin not living out this motto being forward. I, I want to know when folks who are appointed by governors, folks who have at some point led the NAACP, folks who are community organizers and grew up around precinct captains and relatives who were who were um, who were politically motivated community organizers. When did you each know that Wisconsin was in trouble? As soon as I got here, pretty much. This is Francis. Yeah. Okay. So I. All of you on the call on this podcast know that I'm pretty outspoken and verbal. Mm -hmm. However, um, I wasn't that way before I came to Wisconsin. I was considered reserved, quiet. I mean, I was one of those, you said do something. You know, I went to a lot of rallies. I was, we were involved in NAACP and you just showed up. But I wasn't a leader. I wasn't um, volunteering for anything. I just, I mean, in terms of taking a leadership role, I was just... Therefore, the issues fighting for um, injustices, 
because I was told to do that. Your church is involved, you know, all your community groups. So that's what we did in the South. Mm -hmm. Moved to Wisconsin. And you don't see that activism. I didn't when I got here, you know. Even though Wisconsin is known for an activist state, like on campus yeah. and all those things, but you, but you didn't see it when you I came. didn't see it. And remember, you, you talked earlier about the difference between the campus life and the community yes, life. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so I didn't see it on campus, um, being a student. Um, mm -hmm. I felt I was alone. And even working with the undergrads of Alpha Kappa Alpha, so already when I was end up being a graduate advisor, I saw those talented and gifted young folks coming from Chicago and all over. And they were great students in their respective schools in the, in the Chicago area. But when they got to Madison, they were, their, their whole self-esteem, their feelings of confidence and everything just dropped because they weren't getting the respect from the uh, co community environment right. or their professors. You exactly. know, so that... that it, that's what, what makes what made me want to start to speak up and say stuff and get involved is because I didn't see things happening for us here in the community. Mm. I was accustomed mm. to when I grew up in the South, you know, the South mm. may be way behind, but they were really movers and leaders that um, I was involved in and, and saw, you know, so that's when I said, no, I can't, I can't sit back and not say anything. Mm -hmm. And the more you start to talk and question, then people start saying, why don't you do it? You know, they look at you. Yeah. And I guess, so I, I grew up around and not knowing that you, I was building and learning about leadership skills before I even knew that I needed them or knew how to use them. Yes. And people would say, I'll help you out. If you do this, I'll help you. And getting involved with the groups, whether it's Wapsie, whether at that time, Jack and Jill, a lot of groups where black folks supported each other. Um, and you saw role models within our own race in these organizations was very helpful sure. you know and supportive so that's how i got involved um and started to see that there, there needed to be something that changed to, we, we need to do something about the environment that has not stopped it's still an ongoing issue since when i came here in 73 to now things still need to improve for our kids our families yeah you know um, interesting. i want to chime in i want to chime yeah. in on um uh, two factors that have not come up, but certainly they've been referenced here with the uh, the role of WAPSI among black state employees and the role of WAPSI among what I believe uh, uh, political action groups in our communities. And I'll speak to that specifically. But we need to understand that WAPSI had a tremendous impact on uh, black state employees. And that impact was threefold. Number one, it provided them with a sense of worth in the job that they were performing in each and every agency. Number two, it gave them, gave them a venue in which they could come together annually and identify issues and trends and get training. And the most important piece, and I've heard this presented by so many young folks uh, as I performed my task in WAPS, and I had several <laughs> over the years, but people said this, these were young folks, we believe that there's a true interest in our value and who we are in state government, because I think that was a feeling of black folk working for state government prior to WAPSI, where they felt used and not necessarily appreciated. So we need to understand that the critical message from WAPSI to all black state employees was number one, you're valuable and you're worth something. And number two, when we had those conferences, they presented information that was worthy and useful to those individuals that they could take back to the job. So I needed to get that off because one of the jobs I had for Wapsi was involved in the production of the newsletter. And I can remember <laughs> getting those articles from various people, getting them in play, and then working with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections publication unit to get them done. We worked with those people who were prisoners. They would read those articles and they would wow. say, I didn't know this about us. So we were having a bigger impact on people than we thought. But the leadership of YMC was always consistent. It was always directed toward mobilizing and improving the lives of African-American employees uh, in the state government. So I had to say that because number one, when we lost, <laughs> when, we lost YMC, when we lost that organization, we lost a tremendous conduit to developing our young black African-Americans in government. We haven't had that since. So I needed to say that. Second thing I would say, and just to pick it back on what Francis was saying is, once WAPSI uh, uh, lost its presence in state government, 
we've struggled to find a unified, cohesive organizational approach to some of the issues we deal with. And that hasn't been a good, that hasn't been good to sustain our presence in state government. So most of us, like Francis, like Kirby and myself, we, we completed our tenure, retired from state government, but continued the mission and passion uh, for equal opportunity and justice. Mm -hmm. uh, so we continue that fight. So I needed to introduce mm -hmm. that as we talk I about this. Would you, would you say our, our, the recruitment and hiring of black people specifically in state government has diminished since um, the, the ending of WAPSI and that level of, um, of that particular venue? Have we, have we, do we now do a poorer job of, of, of recruiting black people and retaining black people in state government? Now, I need to speak to this because one of the jobs I had in state government was the administrator for the Division of Affirmative Action for 11 years. Okay. Now, that was a unit, as you all know, its role was to complement uh, the employment practices of state government. And this is what I can tell you for a fact. During those 11 years, we saw the number of hires and the representation in the workforce increase for African Americans and other people of color. But to do that, we had to make fundamental changes in some of the policies that were guiding the state classified system. I'm not gonna speak to all of them, but this is what I think fundamentally changed the way and opened the door for us to recruit more effectively and bring young folk in. We pushed what we call, it was called an affirmative action intern program. We introduced those young folk to what government was all about. That became a prime recruiting ground for many of the agencies. Then what we did was change some of the rules and regulations around the merit and recruitment system, things that were working against us. So it took those kinds of engagements to make sure that the system was open. I just, I don't remember all of the numbers for all the years I was there. But I can remember some of the battles we had to uh, to keep things <laughs> moving forward so right. that we could diversify uh, that workforce. So to answer your question specifically, it was a lot of work, but we had to be both. And a lot of it was done quietly. We had to change rules, regulations, the civil service system in some, some respects to make the changes. I can't speak to what the system is now because I don't know the numbers. Sure. But I do know from hearsay uh, that we have lost ground in terms of the overall representation of people of color, particularly African Americans uh, in state government. Greg, it's uh, interesting that you would mention the Aspire program. My department created that program in the city. Exactly, sure and when did. I came over to the state. Sure did. They introduced that program. Right. But can you? I remember. Right now, that program is still existing in in government in the city right. as well as in the state. But those I are like the it. creative things you're talking about pastor g when you say where where's that that level of creativity and that that stamina uh to to fight the system i mean to, to brush up against the system and and hold them accountable Big and time. that's the challenge i see that we're having right now in the, in the community in various uh, state agencies and city government yeah. you right. have people in place yeah. but um are they are they challenging the administration are they speaking truth to power you know oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do, do you, i knew i knew that when i was a uh, the administrator of division of affirmative action that if i wasn't in sync with the goals of wapsi that's the organization we just talked about and collaborating with them and working with them on various tasks and whatever we would not have made the changes. We actually, what I would say, <laughs> diversified the state's workforce. But it wasn't just the Division of Affirmative Action where I worked. It was WAPSI, and it was other organizations in the community and in other, other uh, departments in state government that had an impact. But that needed to be done. Right. Uh, and that, that lasted for a long while. So when we lost WAPSI, um, and it, it ultimately uh, you know, uh, became non-functional, non uh, when we lost WAPSI, we did lose a conduit with a voice that was affecting public policy. And I know for a fact, um, it created a, an outreach arm for new employees, that really, new African-American employees, that really made an impact on them uh, yeah. as far as that growth and development in state service. So, uh, so it had, it had uh, momentum and it had results when it was right. an active organization. But who is the WAPSI today? <laughs> who is the WAPSI today that would help do many of the things that WAPSI did in the past. You know, right. WAPSI was looking. built from the inside structure. I mean, those of us that right. were in, in, and I don't even think I was in an appointed position at the time. I was a civil servant. So okay. it was those of us who had the tenacity 
to know mm -hmm. that it was possible that we could bring black folks together. I mean, we're talking about at a time when if five or six black folks sat in the lunch room together, uh, you know, they thought it was a something was going that's still, on. That still that still happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, let me ask you all this because what's, what I love about this is um, this is really good for not only African American influencers my age. I'm 56, mm -hmm. but those younger, there's there's this thought. There was a picture that um, you all were the cultural giants. People knew you all. They said Kirby, Francis, Gray. You, you know. Like y'all were kind of, you know, like this somebody says Rihanna, Beyonce, like people knew who you all were in this community on first name, on first name basis. Mm -hmm. Do you think your generation did a good job of handing the baton to say my generation? Because we've got uh, to learn from that as we bring the others, others uh, on. Because I've got a perception of what my generation said mm -hmm. about your generation. But what I think I want our listeners to hear, or maybe mm -hmm. what are some of your thoughts about that? And if you were to go back in time, um, would you repeat the way you passed that baton? Or would you say, mm, I think we could have or should have been more open to newer, younger leadership? Like what we've seen is not necessarily as committed or knowledgeable. I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about yeah. your reflection as past NAACP presidents and role models and trendsetters. What was your perception of the generation behind you and their readiness to follow in your footsteps? Okay. Well, that's tough. Yep. Oh, Greg, did you want to go first? I was going to say that is a fair uh, question in light of the evolution of the African-American community and on a broad basis, uh, the evolution of, uh, of uh, our people in general. So let me try to qualify what I'm saying here. Yes, sir. Um, is I have always believed there was a need to transfer the torch. Uh, it's, done, it's done in our churches. It's done in our schools but it hasn't been done as well when it comes to community activism. We could have done a better job of not only bringing young folk in, uh, but also working with them. But I also think that what has happened over time is that there's been a change in terms of the younger generation understanding, appreciating, and relating to the older generations and the way it approached things. Go back to the civil rights movement. When the civil rights movement was active, and I'm talking about the 60s, we had the marches. And we had some of the riots. We had some of those activism kind of activities. That set the tone for change uh, in, our, in many of our communities. Well, we have really got away from that particular model of trying to seek change. So we need to somehow regain that sense of group purposeness, that's what I call it, to make those changes. And I think by not having that as a lead banner, for all of our organizations, whether it's the NAACP or whether it's Urban League or anybody else, we need to have that front and center. That helps us sell our message and our mission. And young folk tend to, because I tell you, I have heard from many young folk who say, yeah, but the NAACP, you're such an old thinking group. <laughs> <laughs> they want to hear fresh, new approaches to resolving problems that they might have. So that would be my contribution to this piece of conversation. How about you, Madam Mayor or Ms. Or Ms. Kirby? What, what, what do you think and reflecting? And again, I'm not saying you all didn't. I'm, I just think it's just such a rich conversation just to, just to have. So my um, contribution along those lines, while I, it hasn't been as focused on the social justice issues, it's more or less working with um, younger folks one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we, I know Kirby and I, we work with our sorority sisters, Mm -hmm. We have we have them uh, those young folks that we can work with to help educate and right. get them involved and keep them involved, Sh keep the history out there because a lot of folks don't understand the history. You know, it's it's like you say, it's Instagram, it's quick things, but you got to know the history before you can move forward. So it's working with um, the, um, the sorority sisters for me, and it's also working like with the NAACP. I love working with the um, AXO program the Afro-Academic Culture Technological and Scientific Olympics, because with those groups, the students are into STEM and humanities and performing arts and visual arts. You get uh -huh. to talk with them about the history, but also get to share with them on how to, how to conduct themselves, how to be successful, not only in that program. It's not about just winning in that program. The skills and conversations and um, format that we have in place will help them be successful when they go to college in their careers. And I think you have to sh 
you have to take time with with these students because what I'm seeing the bigger issue is, and the or the younger folks, shall I say, the bigger issue for me is that there is no um, adults in their life. There's you know there's no Dr. G or Kirby or Greg that spends the time that takes the time with kids that are not our family. Uh -huh. We need people who are going to be out there and invest. They're not going to be the easiest students or kids to necessarily work with, but you have to, you have to not give up on them and work with the parents and the school, the school district, you know, but most importantly, there's a key missing from the kids to, to being successful. Um, you know, parents are hands off. I mean, we, we on this phone call or podcast, we're all hands on with our okay. children and families. Today's generation, I don't see that. I see people hands off. They don't know what's going on. Um, they're afraid to ask the student. They're afraid of their, ch their child. They're afraid to talk to somebody else's kid about something that they're doing wrong. That is still our role. And I, I yeah. think that that's something that we, are, we may not be doing it in big numbers, um, but we try to continue to, to pass that torch on to the younger generation. And I'm not giving up on any student. I don't have a problem saying stuff. But sometimes my husband will say, you need to be quiet. You, you, these people are crazy. You, know, you don't know what they're going to do. But if I see something, as they say, if you see something, I'm going to say something. That's there the way I was brought up. You know, it was that's like, right. you know, we take care of the community. So that's, that's what, you know, that's where we are right now. And I think that's why I'm also involved in, um, if I think about the things I spend time, my time in, in Madison College. You know, I'm the board, the chair of the board right now again, and I'm still, uh, it's because of our students, it's because of the youth, they're our future in education, you know, okay. so you want to have, you want to be at the table to help yes. uh, create a path. Sometimes the work that I do now, um, Reverend G, is not as visible as it was when I was younger. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work I, I do now is behind the scene. You know, I don't have to be the spokesperson, the face of whatever. I just need to make sure that the injustices, the little things behind the scene need to be taken care of so you can run with it as a big picture. That's beautiful. Gotcha. That's beautiful. How about you, Ms. Kirby? Okay. Um, I'm a little torn by the question. On one hand, um, I think you're right. You know, maybe we didn't do such a good job. No, no, and I wasn't saying you all didn't. I just said, I hear the discussion, so I wanted you all to give your take on it. So I'm not saying you all oh. did not. No, this is yeah. coming for me, you know. <laughs> I, sure, sure. I, 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 I struggle with that question now as I, as I re-engage myself back into the community in various levels, in various organizations. That's why we started Blacks for Political and Social Action, and not started, but reinvented. Yeah. Uh, that, that brought that organization back. I was involved in it back in the, in the 80s when we started uh, Blacks for Political and Social Action. And, and, but on the other hand, I think of the work that I'm doing with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Uh, they are just, it, it, they are intricately involved in every aspect of the, the kinds of either health issues, uh, uh, uh -huh. issues with, with government. We meet with the mayor and the county exec every year. We raise issues and bring issues before them. And I see my role in that organization is, as a second VP is to, to help our, our organization in, in strategies and dealing with, with the political figures at hand. I remember there are times when, um, we would uh, want to meet with the, the governor and the mayor and we'd come and it'd be a chit chat session and it and um and how you doing how are things going here the things that we're working on and we'd leave and you know when i became involved it was like no what's the agenda what is their workforce representation what is what are the uh statistics on minority businesses what are they doing you no know, these are the kind of questions we need to bring to the table what's happening on the south side why we don't have a, a grocery store in, in a yep. particular allied community. You know, those are the issues we need to bring to, to bear. And those are the issues that we now discuss. We no longer have time for, uh, I don't want to say playing nice. But we don't have any time for, um, um, you know. Playing nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we have real issues out in the community that they need to, to address and, and, and talk to us about and move forward on. And we hold them accountable. We ask for a report. Right. You know, when we come and meet with them now. So that's my way in, in, in helping in the, um, uh, with, with our organization, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Sure. But also in the, in the workforce, uh, I think that's why we, we, we started 
uh, rejuvenated Blacks for Political Social Action, because we, we believe at a, at a higher level that uh, it will be business as usual if we don't have uh, a, a, a discussion with, with the powers to be, with the governor's office, with the, with, with the mayors, with county uh, superintendents, with the police chiefs. We have a meeting coming up tomorrow and Thursday with the sheriff and with the, uh, the police chief to, to ask about training. Well, how are they training their officers amid this COVID-19 as they approach and, and address uh, particularly the African-American males? And this community is just one step away from some uh, horrific thing happening as it has in other communities with respect to uh, uh, police officers uh, mishandling situations and could end up in a death like we saw in, in Minnesota. So we have to be make sure that they understand that they're accountable to the citizens and bring to, them to the to the forefront. Gotcha. I really, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of each of you. And I appreciate the fact that the Blacks for Political and Social Action has convened and it has members of, of um, traditionally, I don't mean traditionally, but leaders who have, like, like you all, who have led um, um, on so many fronts and then seeing new blood and new people at the table. Right. I love seeing that, that mixture. That really war warms my heart because many of you are retired, so you have more flexibility and time to do things. But you right. still have lived your whole careers as administrators, planners, people overseeing budgets. So you all really know how to put wheels to this thing. Youth. That's what David Hart, Reverend uh, David Hart represents to us. He's an attorney, yes. attorney with the DA's office. He's our, our um, new uh, president. president. We support him, you know. And, I love it. And that, that's what, but you know, I used to think it was a time when, I mean, I thought that I was handing over the leg, the, 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 the time, but I would leave a particular position and the person behind me would be a person of color, mm -hmm. primarily an African-American. And, um, but, but that, and I think when administrations change, you get new governors in, new mm -hmm. mayors and county sex. And if you don't have people standing up to issues and, and raising right. concerns, but they have families at home. So sometimes, you know, that weighs heavily when the time comes to stand up and, and push back. So I, I don't know if, if we, many of us, I, I think you would find that when we left our positions, we tried to make sure that there were people of color or African-Americans in those slots, but the training as to how to, to, uh, to deal with the powers that be in their own organizations and structure, that's where I, I um, I'm not comfortable saying that we did enough. Sure. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. My last question for you all, and this is this is Rich. My, my engineer wrote me a note. He said, I love this hearing the older generation challenging the younger generation. I want to just say <laughs> each of you um, has made yourself available to me in, in endeavors that I'm involved in. Ms. Kirby's been on my board and has given me direction and mentioned me for for well over um a decade and even with some of the work that we're that we were looking at in terms of this center for african-american and cultural advancement and enrichment um each of you made yourself available and 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 making you and the organizations you're part of um um a part of that so that means a lot to me that one you all are staying in the community for whatever reason you all are still here <laughs> wisconsin can't tell you that that's what i would do if i were retired um, but you all have had these illustrious careers you, you worked hard in state government, you retired, and you're still making yourselves available to the community. That is a tremendous example of leadership. I need to let you all know that. That, that motivates me. Sure. And, and, and even though I'm older than your children, because um, I kind of think <laughs> children of that next generation, mm -hmm. um, I'm probably like between you and your, your kids, I'm probably mm -hmm. like a little cousin or something to you mm -hmm. all. Still, in public, I get mad when people call either one of you by your first name, because I'm still thinking you know that's miss francis Ms. Kirby. and people kind of think it's a joke but i said listen I hear you. i'm not old enough to call miss kirby mack by her first name and even and even greg i call greg mr jones or mr greg i know mr greg sounds funny and i ain't gonna call him uncle greg because that might take him back to lower mississippi but, uh, but uh but i listen you know i you know i listen to stuff you say you know mr jones taught me that his grandfather taught him a man ain't got nothing but two things his drawers and a good name i think is that what, is that what grandpa said that's the only way to do it <laughs> I want you all to know that in your in your, um, in your heyday, in your service, in your innovation, you all created. And even in your retirement, 
you're still giving back, whether it's to organizations or individuals, and that is commendable. And if it weren't for folks like you who trailblazed and saw what wasn't here and created it, things like WAPC and other organizations, Wisconsin would be um, far worse for African American mm -hmm. people. So for the mm -hmm. folks who didn't say it, mm -hmm. for the folks who didn't get it, for the folks who are too busy um, sinking or swimming, I want to thank you all for your contributions, for your leadership, and I want to make sure that I'm part of the folks who never, who will never let that be forgotten. And when our Center for Cultural Advancement um, is completed, because my team is saying, if nothing else, COVID-19 has shown folks, white folks, that we need to fix, we need to make sure that we're behind African American led issues. And I think we need mm -hmm. to tell our history and celebrate it. If no one else, I'm sure there will be others. I want to make sure that stories like this are told. I want to make sure that your stories are recorded. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that um, the kinds of work that Ms. Malele did, that others are recording the contributions of you all and your mm -hmm. generation, because that's what made Wisconsin livable. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing the kind of life I have because of folks like you who have trailblazed. And so I appreciate each of you. Um, and actually, as, as a current Fishburg, um, I don't know what we have, Ms. Francis, uh, Fishburg, are we Fishburg. great? Fish burgers. I like that. Actually, I like that. I like the better fish burgers. My last question for you all as we finish up, and I have appreciated your time and enjoyed this so much. Do you regret having raised your family here in Wisconsin? No. 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 Not at all. Mm -mm. And uh, let me let me take a stab quick first Please. and uh, and in a hurry. That um, one of the lessons, fundamental lessons from a grand, my grandmother who was born in 1888 and my mother who was born in 1924. So the legacy is simply this. They said to me early in life that it's important to place yourself in a place that's different than what you know. If you're gonna get better, if you're gonna be challenged, you need to. So that's why I went to uw Eau Claire to experience the difference. My kids, same thing, that they need to know that growing up in Madison, is different because every year they go down south. They understand the Southern culture, history, and legacy. So all I'm saying is this, no, it makes them a better person. The okay. issue is simply this, when they learn the lessons of a Madison, Wisconsin, or a Dane County, Wisconsin, can they apply them later in life? This is where I just want to say the part of our legacy, and I don't think we've done well in, is passing the torch. So we've got to find a way to pass the torch to that next generation. They're the ones that are either gonna benefit from lessons learned and the history that we have laid. So having said that, I would say, no, I think so. But that would be my reply to that That's one. That's good. Ms. Kirby, Ms. Mayor. You know, I always yield to, to, uh, the, to the mayor. Okay, all right. For me, um, I don't regret it. Um, I think that I can say from my daughter who left here, um, she, couldn't wait to graduate to go to an HBCU okay. um, and that then opened up doors she's not coming back you know she's mm -hmm. she's making her life in in North Carolina and actually she works for um, Lowe's um, and she has moved up into um, the corporate office now and there's a black CEO there couldn't she couldn't be there at a better time but one of the things one of the reasons I think that she's somewhat successful not that she's just she's smart but also she grew up in Madison, Verona, K through 12. Her life yep. was surrounded. That, that's all she had in the classroom. She was the only black kid in the classroom. Yes, I remember So that, that while yep. she, she was not a fan of that, she had, that was her only choice. And I think mm -hmm. those skills and the way she learned to deal with uh, the uh, classmates in that environment has helped her in her career. You know, she can be comfortable in the boardroom or comfortable in a, in a meeting where she might be the only one. That's a great um, and she can go out and interact with them as well. But then she also grew up because we always tried to have her involved in the black community here. And I always right. go back to Jack and Jill because that was our group that we started with. Um, right. But any of the groups that look like us, we, I made sure that she was involved in and, and went to mm -hmm. camps and, and interacted. But those being able to be um to cross between both the black community and the non-black community those skill sets were learned here in wisconsin um, so i think that awesome. that helped that helped out tremendously that's great yeah. and miss kirby yeah and i i agree with uh, 
with both Francis and Greg, uh, I, I came here so that I could raise my children. I knew I didn't want to raise them in Chicago. All right. And um, my son and both daughters have done extremely well here. Um, the educational system, uh, if you stay on them, <laughs> can, mm -hmm. can be a, a, a very powerful tool that they'll use for the rest of their life. My son is the first vice president over at Park Bank. He's done extremely yep. well. School, was sent to space camp, uh, number one uh, in Wisconsin in the state to represent us and came out of 101 states across. Was He, he was number one, <laughs> you know, in the space camp oh, right. program oh, right. way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's done extremely well here. Always been in um, uh, highly favored academically. Uh, done extremely well. My, my oldest daughter is with state government now. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> uh -huh. All All right. Right. And your son played football for Wisconsin like his dad did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Uh -huh. He did extremely well. He was a captain. I always had, have to tell my son, my, my husband, that I said, well, Jeff was a captain now. So <laughs> comparing records, I don't know if you were a captain. Uh -huh. of the uh -huh. All right. So, so they've done extremely well. And my youngest daughter is more or less like Francis. Daughter, she couldn't wait to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the exit left out of out of here, and um, she works now for in IT uh, for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And I and I would ask her all the time, Misha, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in different jobs that she go to, how many blacks were there? That that's my mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's why every time she worked for a different company, and I said, how many blacks are working, you know, in, in at the UN in your your department? She says, Ma, I work for the UN. These are United Nations. Mm -hmm. I don't work, <laughs> you know, so she's working with people of different nationalities across the country mm -hmm. in different states. So then uh, she says, I am the only American on the uh, team. Mm -hmm. So, so, oh, I know oh, what oh. so yep. saying that, uh, not to be, not to break, but to say that I know that what this school system can do. Mm -hmm. I know what mm -hmm. it can do for our children. And we want to hold them accountable for that. We want to produce more uh, Jeff Mack, Nisha Mack, and Maina mm -hmm. Macks in in. In this community, who can mm -hmm. stay here? Right, right. Thank right. you. Good point. This is great. I really I appreciate your time. Hey, I want to say to our listeners, my illustrious guests have included Miss Kirby Mack, Miss um, Francis Francis Huntley Cooper, and Mr. Greg Jones. These are folks who came to Madison when it looked nothing like it does today, mm -hmm. and saw what it lacked structurally, um, 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 racially, and ecologically, and they said. Let's change the landscape. Let's mm -hmm. let's create. Let's move. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to hold this ilk of leaders in high regard because, like their children, they came from predominantly black environments and they made their way in Wisconsin. They held teachers and elected officials accountable. And what I take away from their generation mm -hmm. is that it is sure. so easy to complain about what doesn't exist. These are the kinds of folks who made. Um, and created what didn't exist. And what my generation and the generation behind me can do is, is, is to, to mix our, our handle of technology and communications, um, international, international skills, but use it with uh, or combine it with the level of commitment and discipline um, and follow through that um, this generation um has demonstrated if we can bring those strengths and those worlds together we can make wisconsin a better place and i am still hopeful which is why i'm still here is that as long as folks like you all are leaving a legacy and dropping some nuggets of wisdom for us like you've done in this podcast we can work together to really turn the tide in wisconsin i feel that you all have worked too hard to let um the reputation be that this is the worst place for black people to live when you have been able to thrive and, and help your children to do so. And so um, I say this to the folks, the black folks who are listening, let's learn from this generation. To the white folks who are listening, let's get out of the way of black people that are trying to make this change. Um, they created these spaces for black people, white people did not create it and then delegate it. Mm -hmm. And so, so our white list is one of the best things you can do is listen to this black wisdom and make sure that you are not working against this black wisdom. So talk to your right. ER department, your boards, your CEOs, mm -hmm. you have rising stars who happen to be black and other people of color, but this is black like me, we're talking about black people. The <laughs> most you can do is not pity us, Get out of our way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ask us, wait until we tell you what we need, mm -hmm. and then give us the space, the office, the resources, the dollars to make it happen. Because these folks are living witness 
of what can happen when that takes place and they can attest to what happens when it doesn't. And so um, I am glad that I've had a chance to have this conversation. I am still um, motivated by these individuals. I've learned from their examples and they remind me that if in these difficult and trying times of COVID-19 and police brutality, these are the folks that shake their head it's and say and what's new and what else has changed except mm-hmm. social media yep. and now we know it mm-hmm. and yep. so when i see that these folks when miss kirby miss miss francis and, and and mr greg aren't jumping out of windows when they're not saying run to the hills when i see them still you know traveling you know, you know going to work and volunteering it lets me know that the best is yet to come So thank you all for being a part of Black Like Me. Thank you to my special guests, to our listeners. Don't just lean in and listen to this. Share this with someone. Um, Share this with friends that you know. Subscribe. Go to our Patreon page and find out what you can do to continue the work and the podcast and the message of Black Like Me. Um, Go to my website, alexg.com. Go to nehemiah.org backslash join the struggle to find out how you can educate yourselves, non-Black people, on the history and the issues that faces our nation and has always faced our nation. Don't just turn a deaf ear or be entertained by the podcast. Become educated because if you don't, you will be a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. And we need you to be a part of the solution. White folks, black people didn't create this problem. So stop looking to us to fix it. Do your part, break the cycle. All right. And that's really make this country and society great because it never has been because we have never been fully at the table. Y'all haven't seen great until you've seen our beautiful brown faces. So at the table, setting the agenda, call, making the calls. So this has been a very heartwarming, a very fulfilling interview. And um, I want you all just to have a great day. Stay safe. And thank you for making Black Like Me podcast a part of your reality. Take care. Ooh, Black Like Me. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holliday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Ooh, black like me.